Could you give a warm welcome once again to Art Thomas? First and foremost, I, I mentioned I'm, I'm an ordinary guy, and uh, you know I, I like to hang around other ordinary people. And um, I happened to do a little research about your church. Uh, I asked around. I, I started asking, are there any people who, you know, I, I know there's a lot of folks involved in, in ministry here. And I mean, Mount Hope, I know you guys are like a machine for touch and culture, and it's awesome. And I specifically asked for people who were not involved in a particular ministry here, but maybe were engaged in just kingdom living out in the world, uh, just taking initiative for Jesus, not waiting for, for a title or anything like that, just saying, I, God, I love you and I want to do something. And so I just asked for a small list, so obviously not everyone here will be on that list, and I, I apologize. But uh, here's, here's some of the people we got here. I said I learned about a man named Vance whose greatest thrill is to ask complete strangers on the street, do you remember a time in your life when you accepted Jesus into your life? I think that's awesome. I, I learned about a, a, a Jason who ministers to individuals and families, helping them get their finances lined up with the kingdom of God. Then there's Nick, who ministers to military families as a chaplain's assistant. I also learned about Sen, who works with the public schools to locate truants, but ultimately points them to the local church. You have a couple here, Don and Lisa, who run a gourmet restaurant, I love this, and then they give the same gourmet food to the homeless at two locations in the city. Uh, Stan works in a juvenile detention facility and has even been knocked unconscious while trying to minister to a young man. Come on, that's suffering for Jesus, I love it. Then there's Terry and Phil who own an adult care home and love to care for residents, uh, their families, the staff, with the idea of being Jesus with skin on. I just think that's beautiful. Uh, add to this the multitude of other people who are actively involved in many regular ministries here at Mount Hope, uh, doing things all over the city, I'm sure. And uh, there's, you've got a, just a crowd of spirit-filled warriors taking things over for the kingdom of God. I, I, Pastor Kevin and I were talking earlier about just what this, this invasion of God's kingdom could look like in Lansing, and I, I feel like it's already happening. I feel like it's already happening among us, and, and any little nudge I could give you tonight is really just going to open that a little bit further. I don't feel like I have to dig ground and start something, and that's really encouraging as an evangelist to show up and, and uh, have that kind of a setting to walk into. So you have, I'm, I'm, you've got students with incredible talent, you have uh, parents who love and care faithfully, adoptive parents I'm sure who have given healthy Christian families to orphans, and then there's grandparents, great grandparents who are leaving a godly legacy for the generations to come. And uh, it's a blessing to have a church family like that, and I hope you realize it. I hope you realize it. So I'm sure the list could go on and on, but how many of you in just that little bit, you heard a story that, by, by raised hand, you heard a story you didn't actually know about before. How many of you? Yeah. How many of you feel just a little bit encouraged knowing that this stuff is going on all around you? Yeah. How many of you were insulted that I didn't know? Don't, <laughs> didn't list you. If you were insulted that I didn't list you, I'm sorry. Please come see me after. Uh, we'll pray for your salvation. Um, well, <laughs> what I want to talk to you about tonight is encouragement because... It's when we recognize these things in the body of Christ around us that those, those gifts of the Spirit start uh, happening even more regularly. And I'm going to show you how that works, not just through uh, Scripture, but through stories. Uh, hopefully I can fit all this into our allotted time here, and I think I can. They, they told me I have till midnight, so we should be... I'm, just, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> you're clapping, that's encouraging, but I'll be nice. Uh, I have a little boy who needs to go to bed tonight, so uh, you don't have to worry. Um, so tonight, I want to share with you, this is uh, the opening slide here, encouraged people are dangerous. Uh, yeah, that may sound like a strange title, but I have a reason for it, and I want to share all that with you today. Uh, Proverbs 26, verse 8. It says, like tying a stone in a sling is the giving of honor to a fool. That'll preach, huh? <laughs> How many of you ever <laughs> paid attention to that verse? Yeah. Like tying a, a stone in a sling is the giving of honor to a fool. 
And this has everything to do with encouragement. I actually have here a sling that I tied a stone in. Uh, this is like one of those old school King David type slings. Well, it would be Shepherd Boy David, wouldn't it? And uh, ideally, you're supposed to, to start whipping this thing around. Oh, there we go. It really is tied in there. And then you let go of one side and pop the giant in the head, right? We know the story. Well, if it's tied in here, am I dangerous to any giants or enemies? No. If it's tied in here, I'm really only dangerous to the people standing right around me. Right? When you give honor and encouragement to a fool, when you're building up the fleshly side, the flesh nature, what you're doing is you're making people dangerous to those around them. You're tying a stone in a sling. On the other side of the coin, when you give honor to Christ's nature in people and you start pointing out what he's doing, you're untying that stone. You're making giant slayers. You are arming weapons. That's what we're talking about tonight. So uh, the Hebrew word for honor in this passage means dignity, reputation, reverence, and glory. So to give dignity, reputation, reverence, and glory. And the Hebrew for fool used here refers to a haphazard and arrogant person. And isn't that what we all are in our flesh? Yeah, we do stupid things and then we're proud of ourselves for it. <laughs> yeah, haphazard and arrogant. You don't want to reverence those things. We want to reverence Christ. Either way, uh, an encouraged person is dangerous, whether it's dangerous to the people around them or dangerous to the enemy. If that person is encouraged in the things of this world, then he's only dangerous to those who come near him. If, however, the person is encouraged in the things of God, then he or she becomes dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. 1 John 3, 8 says the reason the Son of God, Jesus, right? The reason he came into the world was what? Anybody know? To destroy the works of the devil. You know, Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I send you, right? You ever seen that one? Yeah, destroying the devil's work. So imagine then what could happen if a church full of people who live for God, like this one, developed a sustained culture of mutual encouragement and honor. Here we have an army of loaded weapons ready to destroy the devil's work. Today I want to help you develop such an intense atmosphere of encouragement at your church that when the devil hears the name Mount Hope, he shudders. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see encouragement overtake and obliterate the culture of criticism that is in many of our American homes. I want to see the pride and arrogance overcome with honoring others. Can it happen? The answer is in your hands. <laughs> See, I can share the message, but you have the free will to decide what to do with it. So let's get rolling. Romans 12, 9 through 10. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. I find if I honor others above myself, I don't have to worry about whether or not I'll get any honor. <laughs> because it starts to reproduce in other people and they start saying, wow, I, I want to be like that. They start honoring others above themselves and before I know it, people are honoring me. Now that's not a selfish way of going about it, but it is to say I don't have to go anywhere and make myself known. I, <laughs> this, you know, I'll, I'll just tell you this because uh, you're, you're kind of like family to me here. In fact, you're very much like family. Uh, especially after that awesome dinner you gave me. <laughs> when my wife and I stepped out into traveling ministry, this was April of 2011, uh, one of the things the Lord told me to do was, until further notice, which I haven't had that further notice yet, he said, never solicit for a speaking engagement. Never go to a pastor and say, hey, can I speak at your church? So just the very fact that I'm here... <laughs> is proof that you don't have to promote yourself. You don't have to. If you'll just do what God asks you to do, he'll take care of everything. What's it say? Uh, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and my paraphrase is, and everything else will be taken care of. Right? All the other stuff, 
piece of cake. We're living proof of it and we're seeing it. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. I love that. So if you're already encouraging each other, don't say, hey, I don't need this message. Because Paul didn't think that that was a reason not to encourage this church to encourage each other, even though they were already doing it. Keep at it. Keep at it. So my first point, encouragement and honor give a person ammunition for boasting. That may sound strange, but I'm going to point it out here. You have to make sure you are loading the right weapon. (laughs) <laughs> First John 2, 16 to 17. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So the boasting of this world doesn't come from God. And when you encourage the things of this world, it produces boasting in the things of this world, and that doesn't come from God. So what you're doing is you're ministering worldly things and not actually ministering heaven to earth. Now, does that mean you can't say to your coworker, hey, you did a good job? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to focus on those heavenly things. We need to go out of our way to notice that what's happening in the spiritual realm, not just what's happening in the physical realm. Instead of just saying, hey, you did a great job, you could say, hey, I really notice you do things with excellence. Because that's a part of Christ's nature. That's a trait of Jesus. And when you start pointing out those kind of things, it makes the person say, wow, I want more of that in my life. And I know some of you are thinking, well, what if they're not saved? Well, when you encourage somebody in something, it makes them want to do more of it, right? Yeah. I mean, with my little boy, if I'm encouraging him in something, he wants to do just that. And that's all he wants to do. He rode his swing for an hour the other day. Yeah. Yeah. People start to try, and if they're not saved, they're going to discover very quickly they can't do it, and maybe that'll get them to cry out to Jesus for help. (laughs) If they are saved, then it's going to be producing more and more of that fruit in their lives. So, it's a Uh, (laughs) win-win. Jeremiah 9.24, here's the other side. But let him who boasts boast about this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. So I have no problem standing in front of you tonight and saying, I know him. And I'm so glad I know him. (laughs) I understand him, I know him. It may sound arrogant, but the Bible said I'm allowed to boast about that. (laughs) Oh, Jesus is so good. So whatever you encourage in a person, they're going to boast in, and encouraged people are dangerous. So are you loading the right weapon? Encouragement and honor either stimulate spiritual growth or they work against it. Again, which weapon are you loading? Is it flesh or is it spirit? Let me show you what this looks like when people are encouraged in worldly, natural, fleshly matters. Isaiah 41, 6 through 7. They help each other and say to their companions, be strong. The metal worker encourages the goldsmith and the one who smooths with the hammer spurs on the one who strikes the anvil. One of the, uh, says of the welding, it is good. The other nails down the idol so it will not topple. When we encourage people in the works of the flesh, they produce quality works of flesh. And typically, they tend to be idols. They start to invest themselves in that thing instead of investing themselves in the kingdom. Because they're getting encouragement in it. I'm not saying you should discourage everything. I mean, like, for instance, kids in sports. Should you discourage kids in sports? No, that that wouldn't be nice. Uh, Should you encourage them? Well, if you're encouraging just the worldly side of it, I'd say that's a waste of their life. If you're encouraging the kingdom attributes that are being developed in them through that sport, I think that's valuable. Just my personal opinion. You can do with that what you want. (laughs) Works of the flesh don't last. Psalm 64, 5 through 8, they encourage each other in their evil plans. They talk about hiding their snares. They say, who will see it? They plot injustice and say, we've devised a perfect plan. Surely the human mind and heart are cunning. But God will shoot them with his arrows. (laughs) Lovely. 
They will suddenly be struck down. He will turn their own tongues against them and bring them to ruin. All who see them will shake their heads in scorn. Nobody wants that for an inheritance, right? That's uh, not what we're aiming for. See, natural encouragement made these people dangerous to others, but it only brought ruin to themselves. I could stand up here and swing that sling around for quite a while, and as long as you're all sitting out there, you're safe. But I might whap myself in the head. Yeah. Like tying a stone in a sling is the giving of honor to a fool. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong for you to say to your coworker, hey, you're doing a great job. What I am saying is that this kind of encouragement is not eternally focused. <laughs> It'd be better to say, you know, I've noticed you care about your clients, or I noticed that you care, like I said, about doing things with excellence. And, and again, you're pointing out Jesus in them. So we want to look at these spiritual matters. Hebrews 3, 12 to 13. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You notice that term, so that? It's implying that there's a value to this encouragement. If you encourage each other, it's so that none of you will be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Encouraging a person in his or her spiritual identity in Christ cultivates freedom from sin. So do you know someone who's struggling with sin? Maybe your husband or wife. <laughs> no throwing elbows here. That's right. Yeah, I don't want to cause marital problems. Do you know someone who's struggling in sin? Maybe what they need is less of pointing out the sin and more of pointing out the virtues of Christ. Because as you encourage them, they start to be steered away from sin's deceitfulness. Ah, so really, the ammunition for the weapon is in your hands. I decided a long time ago that I would start taking responsibility it sounds strange, but decide to start taking responsibility for the people around me. Not in the sense that I have to micromanage their lives, but in the sense that if they are living lives of sin, I go to the Father and say, what do I need to change so that they don't live in sin? I want to be the kind of person that when people get around me, they have a hard time living any, any way other than looking like Jesus. Yeah. I haven't perfected it yet, but that's my goal. And I think that should be all of our goals. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, you know, if, if somebody sinned, it was, you know, the whole nation was under some kind of discipline. Like, you know, Joshua in the Battle of Jericho, and then was, Achan takes something, it was, they were told to destroy everything, but he takes it, hides it, and the next battle they go to, they're thinking, oh, this will be a piece of cake, Jericho was a piece of cake, and then pff, they're blasted. And they come back saying, what's the deal? And they discover this one person with their hidden sin, See, I, I've decided we're, we're way more interconnected than we often give ourselves credit for or give God credit for. He designed us a special way so that we would love each other as a family, not just as people who sit next to each other week after week. And as we love each other as a family, we start to look out for each other. We start to encourage the things of Christ in each other because what I see in you also is an identifier of me. So I want to point out the things that I want to be associated with. And I want to encourage those things in you so that you'll grow in those things. And then I get to say, hey, I get to hang out with a lot of really cool people. When we were at dinner, I was just bragging on my small group. I mean, we've got, <laughs> my dad shared, my parents are here, uh, clap for them. The uh, Bible says, honor your father and mother, you'll live a long life and it will go well for you. So I'm banking on that blessing. Um, <laughs> He was sharing a testimony of how just a few months ago they, they drove up from Tennessee, they're retired now, but they came and visited our small group and my dad had for, how many years ago was the accident? Five years ago he was in a rollover accident and got a piece of glass stuck behind his eye. And it was causing horrible irritation and the doctors couldn't do anything about it, they couldn't even find it, but you know, it was obvious there was something there so they gave him a cream to take care of it. But about once a month it would flare up with irritation and every morning after he w when he was in the shower with that heat and steam and everything, his eye would just be irritated. Well, he and my mom drove up the 10 hour trip to Michigan and arrived just in time for our small group meeting. And uh, sure enough, he, uh, he, he's been in pain this whole time. 
uh, tr trying to drive out of one eye. I think my mom drove most of it, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> not good. We were about to start the meeting. He says, look, I need you guys to pray for me before we start because I'm just in so much pain. So what I do is I, you know, I, I do a lot of healing stuff all over the world and I love to do that. But what I love even more is putting it in the hands of other people. So what I did, I just sat back and I said, hey guys, who wants to pray for my dad? And uh, two of our guys jumped up, ran over, put their hands on his eyes, said, I be healed in Jesus' name. And... Uh, How's it feel? <laughs> That's all you got to do, right? And uh, my dad said, well, it feels a little better. Is it 100%? No, no. I be healed in Jesus' name. How about now? Not really. I be healed in Jesus' name. How about now? Not really. And my dad's finally like, look, you've got a meeting. Let's do the meeting, and you can pray for me afterward. Well, no sooner than that, he says he hears an audible voice say, I'm going to remove the glass from your eye, and it's going to hurt really bad for about 20 seconds. Don't worry, I'm taking it out. So all of a sudden he has this searing pain and feels something come from the back of his eye to the front and he wipes out, he runs to the bathroom, wipes out this little piece of glass with pus around it and uh, sure enough, no problem since. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's what just ordinary people are doing in my small group and I get to be associated with them. I love it. I would much rather tell you that story than tell you a story about something I did. Because that's what they're doing. They're over at their church telling about me. <laughs> uh, no, it's so good. It's so good to just be with people and to call out those things of Christ in each other. Uh, where was I? We did Hebrews 2 or 3? 3? All right. Encouraging a person in his or her spiritual identity cultivates freedom from sin. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Encouragement produces love. It produces good works. It produces unity. In this way, it destroys the devil's work. Encouraged people are dangerous. Spur one another on toward love and good works. The key is, is simply this. Focus on love, not law. 1 Corinthians 8, 1, the second half of it, it says, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Good. The Greek word for knowledge here, uh, it refers to figuring out and focusing on what things are right versus wrong. Uh, the best correlation, even though I know it's Hebrew versus Greek, but like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil back in the Old Testament, um, people like to figure out right and wrong, and, and instead of just going to the tree of life and just loving Jesus and letting him tell you, okay? Uh, so knowledge, this focusing on and figuring out things that are right versus wrong, puffs up. But love builds up. See, love knows how to build a person up regardless of whether or not they're doing everything right. Let me say that again. Love knows how to build a person up regardless of whether or not they're doing everything right. A lot of times we're afraid to encourage people because we're like, well, their life's not all there and I don't want them to get a big head or anything. No, stop it. Encourage, love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. God doesn't speak things into your life because you're perfect. He speaks things into your life so that you'll follow those things and become perfect. Amen. And if you're a prophetic voice in somebody's life, then your job is not to just speak to them because they're perfect and say, oh, you're wonderful, you're so perfect. Your job is to speak life to them and call out the things that are not as though they are and start bringing life to that person. Just, just came to my mind. Uh, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. There's another passage. I think it's in John 5. I didn't prep this. But Jesus said, the Father gives life to whomever he chooses. And since I'm his son, the son also gives life to whomever he chooses. Which I thought was a profound statement. You have the capacity as a son, as a child of God, to give life. To give life. Pastor Kevin and I were talking about uh, raising the dead 
in our little dinner earlier. In fact, I've got a friend here who has raised the dead. Yeah, you're sitting with spiritual champions in this room. God's doing this stuff today. 52 different nations, documented cases of the dead being raised, and that's just in the last 25 years. Not the last 30 years now. Wow. It's happened. And, that, and some of those 52 nations, we're talking hundreds of cases. Yeah. It's happening. I want to expand your mind to say, wow, God can actually do this stuff. Because having a renewed mind helps us to walk in the will of God. Yeah, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will, Romans 12, 2. It's interesting, we often are very comfortable with God's will being good and perfect, but pleasing, mm, we're often afraid that God's will is going to be uncomfortable and horrible, and I don't know if I really want to hear God's voice because uh, he's going to ask me to do something I don't want to do. I'll tell you what, I've done a lot of things that in my flesh I was uncomfortable but afterward, I think it was the greatest experience of my life. A year ago, almost exactly, in the month of October, I spent half a month out in the bush of Uganda all by myself. Preached in Muslim villages with witch doctors, and it was fantastic. I loved it. Now, in the moment, I was scared out of my gourd. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, the reason I went is, number one, I had been invited. <laughs> number two, I felt like you know, you ever notice in the book of Acts where the apostles say it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit to tell you this? Yeah, that's when they're given instructions about the Jewish customs and what they should and shouldn't do. It seemed good to me and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit, so I went with it. And I had people encouraging me along the way. And an encouraged person is dangerous. I was just an ordinary guy. I still am. But by the time I came back, I had seen hundreds of people healed, hundreds of people saved. And one particular story I want to share with you because I think it fits this context. On the last day of my trip, we, I, we had gone back through Kenya because that's where my flight was taking off from. And there in Kenya, I was invited to a, uh, 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 an elementary school. There were about 300 kids. In fact, I have a video of it, but I didn't have time. If you want to see the video, you can go to youtube.com slash artthomasministries. So... Then you can see that the story is true. Uh, but here I am sitting there with, with all these uh, 300 kids, 300 Kenyan school kids, and my job is just preach the gospel. So I do. And I told them about the people who I saw in the pe previous couple weeks who were from Muslim families that when they became Christians, their families kicked them out onto the streets, and that was it. They're orphans now. I said, I can't guarantee you that if you become a Christian that everything's going to be wonderful, but I can guarantee you that it's worth it. So I gave this little altar call, if you will. I said, how many of you want to receive Jesus right now for the first time in your life? Every kid in the room stood. These kids counted the cost. We have it very cheap here. It's very low cost in America. These kids said, you know what? Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. He's worth it. So I had my translator pray them through a prayer of salvation in Swahili. And then, then I said, how many of you, you know, Jesus said in Mark 16, these signs will accompany those who believe. So how many of you would like to see what Jesus can do through you now that you believe? And okay, sure. One of the signs Jesus said was they'll lay their hands on the sick and they'll recover. Okay. He didn't say if you're old enough, so I figured this applied. Um, so I said, how many of you have eye problems, ear problems, pain, disease, sickness, uh, headache, stomach ache, and then my mistake, I said, a bump, a scrape, or a bruise, and everybody stood. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I was going to have the kids sitting, pray for the one standing. That wasn't going to work anymore. So I paired them off. I said, pray for each other. Here's what you do. Find out what's wrong. Put your hand where the problem is, and just say, you know, if it's shoulder, say, shoulder be healed in Jesus' name. Okay? So... I let them at it, and they did. And about 30 seconds later, I kind of calmed it down. I said, all right, now test it out. If you know you're healed, if you can prove it, you can do something you couldn't do, the skin's healed over, whatever it is, I want you to sit. Half the group sat down. Now, it would have been easy to stop there, but my Jesus paid for more. So <laughs> I said, all right, we're gonna pray again. If you're still standing, we're gonna pray again. So we prayed a second time whatever it's just the kids i'm just standing back letting them do it I said all right all right if you can test it out test it out you know you're healed sit down half of that group sits down do it one more time 
everybody except one little boy in the front row, and when I watched the video later, I discovered no one was praying for him the second or third time, so now it makes sense. Everybody's sitting except the one little boy. I said, what's your problem? He said, my eyes, I can't read. I said, well, okay, eyes open in Jesus' name. How's that? And I opened a Bible, held it out to him, and he smiled and starts reading from it. 300 kids, all of them get healed. I only touched one of them, so it's not my fault, all right? <laughs> Jesus paid the price. These kids have been saved for five minutes. What's your excuse? Oh, come on. <laughs> I, I hate to say it this way because I know Mount Hope's not like this, but you know how America is. These kids haven't sat through enough sermons to find out God doesn't want to heal. Okay. <laughs> they just had a little tiny bit of encouragement that said you can do this. And that little bit of encouragement made dangerous weapons against the kingdom of darkness. Demons fled. Every kid, 300 kids, all of them got healed. Everything from scrapes and bruises healing over like you couldn't see anything, eye problems, ear problems, everything, gone. Jesus can do it. In fact, there, there was one church I spoke at in Illinois uh, early in my, my preaching career here, and uh, I made a big mistake. There was this guy who came in with a cane, and he sat down, and I was preaching about healing, and I was so proud of myself because this guy was weeping as I preached about healing. It was like, oh, I'd, he'd never heard the words I was speaking. I didn't know the reason he was weeping is because he was in pain. He didn't take his pain meds that night because he's like, if this guy is going to heal me, I want it to know it's legit and it's not just pain meds. So this guy, it turns out he had 16 inches of titanium in his back. He uh, had rods and screws, plates, all that stuff, and he was bedridden 20 hours a day. In fact, there's a video of this on YouTube, too, if you want to see his daughter share the testimony two days later, because he was at his Baptist church who didn't believe in healing, proving to them that it works. <laughs> yeah. But here, th this guy, he comes up to the front, and the church gathers around him, and the people pray for him. I said, how do you feel? He said, well, let's test it out. He walks to the piano, walks back. I said, well, how do you feel? He goes, I, I haven't walked like that in years. I said, well, do it again. So he walks all the way around the sanctuary, and the people are going wild. His wife is bawling. His daughter is bawling. He gets halfway around, and all of a sudden, it's just quiet. You can see this on the video. Like the, it, it got past the cheering stage, and reality set in. Like Here's this guy that they have seen in excruciating pain for years, and he's carrying his cane, walking upright around the sanctuary. And he gets back up to the front and looks me in the eye. He says, I've been married to this for years. I said, I'm just thinking, buddy, the contract's canceled. It's over. It's over. Jesus paid a very high price. And if we'll encourage one another, we're going to see this stuff happen. And, and so what I learned from this experience is I'm not going to wait till the end. If there's anybody here right now, you're in pain, I want to deal with that because I don't want you to have to sit through me yammering on and on. If, you, if you're in some kind of pain, stand up if you're able. If you're not able to stand, just wave your hand, all right? And everybody who is not standing or doesn't have a hand up, you're the prayer team, okay? All right, let's, let's cross out. If there's only a couple, let's uh, open it up. If, got, if you need healing of any kind, you've got some disease, some sickness, even if it's just something as simple as a little ache or pain that you've got right now, I want you to stand. All right. Now, if you're near one of these people, all I want you to do is just reach. If you can reach them and touch them, do that. If you're near them, just, just you know, reach a hand out and uh, toward them if you can. Jesus, thank you for paying the price. Thank you for paying the price. You paid it all. You paid it all. Look around. If you see someone who doesn't have someone praying for them, please go to them. I see someone way over on the corner here. So, yeah. Pain go in Jesus' name. Sickness go. In Jesus' name, be healed. Now, I want you to test something out if it's, if it's something that can be tested. Try moving. Try doing something you couldn't do before. Is there any change? If there's any kind of change, wave at me. I want to... Yeah, what happened? <laughs> Come on. Pain in his heels for six months. 
Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else yet? Don't sit down. If you, if you haven't received yet, don't sit down and keep praying for them. Anybody else yet? I've got a lot of lights coming at me, so wave real. Yeah, what happened? I don't know if you heard that. Rheumatoid arthritis since six months ago. He's been having excruciating pain, and during worship it was really bad, and now gone. Come on. <laughs> Jesus, you're so good. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah. Irregular heartbeat, beating normal now. Wow, Jesus, you're good. Anybody else? Anybody else? If you're still standing, people are praying for you, try testing it again, see what happened. Is that a hand? Yeah, what happened? Pain in the chest and the back, gone. Thank you, Jesus. You see, he paid for it. He paid for it. Yeah, what happened? That's so cool. That's so cool. You know, I've found, like, I've, I've been healed of, my parents are here and can testify. I used to have scars on my face from second degree burns and Jesus healed them four and a half years before it was medically possible for them to go away on their own. Uh, and that was within a month of suddenly praying for it. I, I just suddenly was like, Jesus wants to heal this. And there's more to the story, but every day for a month, I put my hands on my face. I said, Jesus, take the scars. And a month later, they were gone. Yeah. So I know he does this stuff. And so now I run across people with scars and I've just got all the faith in the world that they're going to be healed. Like whatever you've been healed of, hold on to that. You know, the Bible says hope deferred is a uh, 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 hope deferred makes the heart sick, but the longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Testimonies are longings fulfilled. They're meant to nourish you over and over and over. Hold on to those testimonies. All right, test it out again. If you're still standing, anything change. Be healed in Jesus' name. Any changes? All right. Do not be discouraged. Here's the beauty of it. Jesus paid for it. Okay? Jesus paid for it. To me, that's a guarantee. I do have more I want to preach to you. <laughs> this is such an awkward way to do this. But I feel like, I, I just felt like God was saying, do it now, do it now. In Jesus' name, be healed. I want you to continue to pray for these people. It's, this is not a spectacle. I'm, I'm not the guy to expect me to do it. Like, we're, we're the body of Christ here. You have just as much Holy Spirit in you as I have in me, which is all of him. <laughs> ah, thank you, Father. Yeah, God, keep touching him. Keep touching him. Thank you, God. More, more. Be healed in Jesus' name. Ankle pain, go in Jesus' name. Back pain, go in Jesus' name. Knees, be healed in Jesus' name. Eyes, open. Any deafness or partial deafness in this room, I command you, ears open right now in Jesus' name. Open now in Jesus' name. All right, test it out again. Any changes? Wave a hand. Do I see a hand over there? Yeah, that's so many lights. I'm sorry. What happened? Oh, it's just praying? Okay. Anybody else? All right. Here's what we're going to do. At the end of the meeting, uh, I think they're going to put me back there by the table so I can greet people. But if you still need prayer for healing, I want to pray for you personally. Because I am dead set convinced like a pit bull that God wants this for you, all right? Because Jesus paid a very high price for it. If I went to Walmart, bought the most expensive big screen television they have, had it shipped to my house, opened the box and it's empty, I'd be pretty irate. Because I paid a big price for that. 
And Jesus paid a way higher price than a measly few thousand dollars for you to be healed. He could have skipped the whipping post, but he didn't. He paid the same price for sickness and disease as he paid for sin, and he paid for all of it. Yeah. What happened? Hearing's been restored. Come on, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Isn't he good? Isn't he good? Yeah. Awesome. I, I have seen hernia just go, I've seen it on four occasions now. And you would be number five if it's gone. So come tell me afterward. You know, yeah, we'll, we'll find out. That's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Again, if you still need prayer, come see me afterward. I really, I really do want to pray for you. But I have a message I have to wrap up, and we've only got a little bit of time here. So let's do it. Uh, so focus on love, not law. Focus on love, not law. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. We talked about knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Love covers a multitude of sins. We talked about that. Biblical encouragement overlooks shortcomings and honors what Christ has already accomplished in a person's life. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says that love is not proud. Love is not proud. And here's a fun one for you. The Greek word for proud means to puff up, inflate, or cause to swell. Uh, but according to Thayer's Greek Dictionary, it also means to make natural or cause a thing to pass into nature. Now let's think about that. In our pride, in our pride, we often rob people of their spiritual identities. By focusing on a person's natural condition, we take their eyes off of their spiritual potential in Christ. If you see the infinite God revealing himself in a believer, then you expect to draw from that resource. Let me say that again. If you see the infinite God revealing himself in a believer, then you expect to draw from that resource in that person. Yeah. But when you don't look for what the Holy Spirit is doing in a person, all you can focus on is their natural condition. So do you see how our pride can cause others to live according to the world's limits rather than the limitless kingdom of God? Let me illustrate this a little further. I'm going to unpack that idea for you because I know it's, it's a big wordy statement. So let's make it simple. Biblical encouragement in love does not focus on the natural aspects of a person's life. It does not cause them to pass into nature. That would cause the person to put more effort into those natural things. Rather, biblical encouragement keeps people focused on spiritual things. Biblical encouragement helps people obey Colossians 3.2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Interestingly, this Greek word for proud is the same one used in the previous verse when it says knowledge puffs up. Love is not proud, knowledge puffs up. You see how they're all, it's Paul saying the same thing here. In other words, focusing on a person doing the right or wrong earthly things, including things like his or her appearance, job, economic status, eloquence, talent, or even their hard work, it tends to cause that person to strive to excel in those earthly things. Our encouragement of earthly things puffs them up causes them to pass into nature, to be more natural. See how that's working? But love builds up. In other words, when we focus on the nature of Christ in a person, like his character, his humility, his joy, his compassion, his goodness, his graciousness, his kindness, we add fuel to the fire in that person's spiritual life. Depending on whether you encourage a person in natural things or spiritual things, you're either inflating them with the breath of God or with hot air. And which would you rather have as the identity of your church? People full of the Spirit or people full of themselves? What are you encouraging? Think about how you answer that because the identity of your church starts with you. Ask the Holy Spirit which is more true of you. Are you more full of the Spirit than you are full of yourself? 
or is it the other way around? See, the culture of a church is not set by the pulpit. The culture of the set church is set by the people. My third and final point. Encouragement and honor work hand in hand with God's power. And here's where we start tying in the gifts of the Spirit. Encouragement, first of all, is a natural result of Christians practicing spiritual gifts and participating in each other's lives. How do I know? It's in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 14, 26, and then verse 31 as well. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. I know that's why every other week you have your home groups. Yeah. I mean, a big setting like this, it would be really hard for us to have time all night for everybody to prophesy, everybody to encourage, everybody to share everything that God has invested in them. But that's why you have those small group gatherings. And I want to encourage you, go to them. If you're not already, go to them. I I see God move more in, in home group settings just because I have to be vulnerable and other people have to be vulnerable with me. I can't hide behind a pulpit. (laughs) And it's good. It's healthy. We all need that in our lives. So if you're not already in one, I encourage you, get involved, get involved. As we practice spiritual gifts and as we minister to each other, we all get encouraged. Every single one of you has something of Jesus placed within you by the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't seen it yet, then maybe you just need a little encouragement to bring it out. And hopefully that's what this sermon will do for you. Now second, honor paves the way for God to use unlikely vessels, like the person sitting next to you right now. Which if you do the math, that includes you for the person sitting next to you. Uh, Unlikely vessels, we're all one of them. I'm unlikely. We all are. But encouragement is what draws that power of God out of us. If I look at one of you with natural eyes and consider you to be the same old person I've known for years, then I'm not inviting you to be anything different than that. Think about that in the context of your church family. Some of you, I know Pastor Kevin's been here his whole life. Some of you have been here years. And if all you can do is look at people and see the same person you grew up with, then that's all you're going to expect out of them. (laughs) Let me think about that a little further. I will never have the privilege of encountering God's power through your life if all I can see is the person you were and not the person that Christ is in you. But if I look at you with spiritual eyes and recognize the grace of God in your life, then I'll be able to draw from that resource and experience God through you. A couple winters ago, uh, there was a young man who we received word that he was out scraping ice off his car. A piece of the ice scraper popped off, hit him in the eye, and took out a chunk of the white part. He was in excruciating pain. He, uh, you know, word came to us, uh, I think it was my mom who called us and said, hey, this happened and we need to pray. So, it just so happened, this was just before our Thursday night small group, we got together, our group prayed, uh, and sure enough, now, let me tell you a little more of the story. This young man uh, didn't have insurance, but his mom, who was a little more well off, she took him to the doctor and the hospital and, and they checked it out. He couldn't even open his good eye because that, the pain was so much. And when they finally got a, enough of a look at it, they said, look, we, we don't know if you're going to, it's looking like you might have vision problems. We're not entirely sure what's going to happen. Um, it's going to take at least a week before you're able to really open that eye. There's going to be quite a healing process here, and we don't know what it's going to look like. Well, our small group prayed on Thursday night, and the next morning he woke up totally fine. The white part of his eye had grown back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> now... The story doesn't end there. First of all, it just so happens this young man was my nephew. Uh, So (laughs) there was a little bit of family investment here. And uh, in fact, this picture that I want to show to you here is him getting baptized in our bathtub just a few months later. (laughs) That one moment of dramatic healing and uh, we told him, yeah, we prayed for you and buddy, Jesus did it. This brought him around. 
couple months later, he's getting baptized in our bathtub. He and his wife are attending our small group. And uh, that summer, this, that was in the winter when all that happened. By summer, here's this little video. You can go ahead and put that up. We don't need sound, but just let that play. This is a bonfire that we held as a small group. And it just so happened this young man brought roughly six to $8,000 worth of DVDs that were not honoring to God. And he said, I'm putting them in there and burning them up. So I don't want that stuff in my life anymore. This is a life transformed. And it started with a healing. But the story doesn't end there. <laughs> a, a little bit after that, we, were, uh, we had a, a small group meeting, and he's there. And, and uh, we had someone who was having some physical pain. And, and I said, who wants to pray for him? And so a number of people gathered around, just like I told you with my dad. And, and they be healed in Jesus' name. How's it feel? And they got to this point where the person was like, you know, it's like 90% better, but there's just this little tinge of something. You know, like Jesus ministered to a blind man, and after he had ministered to him, he said, what do you see? He said, I, I, I see people like trees walking around. So Jesus did what? He put his hands back on the man's eyes, and then his vision was fully restored. So if Jesus gets two turns, we get like 10, right? So, so we just kept going at it. 90%, it was like the ceiling we couldn't break through. My nephew... I said, is there anyone else who just, you haven't prayed yet, you just want to give it a shot. My nephew speaks up, be healed in Jesus' name. Boom, totally healed. Okay? Now, it doesn't stop there. A little bit, uh, about an hour or so later, we're praying for someone else, and they're having pain, and it gets to 90% healed. And I look at my nephew, I say, hey, Brandon, you want to hit this one up? He goes, be healed in Jesus' name. Boom, totally gone. <laughs> Now, if I looked at my nephew as the same runt that I used to run around with and wrestle and, and I always thought he was less than me because I was so special, right? If I still saw him that way, then I would never have seen the gift of God in his life and drawn that out of him. Do you see how this works? If I invest myself more in drawing Jesus out of others than I do in trying to be everything I can be, What's going to happen is I'm going to see more of Jesus and it's going to start to affect my life. I'm going to start to become more like Jesus. Even Jesus himself looked at his disciples, the most unlikely vessels there ever were, and he said, look, anyone who believes in me is going to do the same things I'm doing. In fact, he's going to do greater works than these. Now, I've heard people teach that, that by greater he meant more in quantity, and I'm, I'm all right with that because we are seeing more in quantity. But it's interesting, you know, in Acts 5, you see Peter walking down the street and his shadow is healing people, and I don't remember anywhere where Jesus' shadow healed people. I mean, was Peter arrogant because he was doing more than Jesus, or was he fulfilling a prophecy of Christ? You know, when I, when I look at, uh, I just... Just spent a little bit of time with uh, Reinhard Bonnke. I got to go one of, to one of their big crusades in Africa. There was, at this one, it was one of the smaller ones that had like 70,000 people. <laughs> yeah, they've, they've had as many as a million in one meeting. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the videos. It's incredible. And they've had, well, uh, 1.6 million attending, over a million salvations. And those are the ones that filled out documented cards saying, I've got saved tonight. I mean, they're seeing incredible harvest. And Reinhard Bonnke, Daniel Kalenda, his successor, they'll stand on that stage, they'll say, be healed in Jesus' name, the same thing we just did, and scores of people will get healed. And honestly, I can't find anywhere in the Bible where Jesus stood in front of a crowd of people and just declared it, and a bunch of people got healed all at once. Now, does that mean he didn't do it? No, I mean, he could have, but I would have expected the disciples to have documented that. Does that mean that they're not doing biblical things? No. They're doing the greater works Jesus promised they would do. I want you to open up. The, the sky is the limit. The sky is the limit. And I want you to call that sky limit out in other people. Don't put caps on people. The only reason we put caps on people is because we're insecure about our own level of spirituality. I'll let that one marinate a little. <laughs> Jesus wants... The body, living, breathing, active. The body of Christ, representing Him. Bringing the kingdom to earth. Every one of you. Every one of you. Notice what happened to Jesus in His hometown. 
the people started looking at the natural side of things. In fact, here's what it says in Mark 6, 1 through 5. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Now get this. (laughs) Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? And the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Now, notice what they did right there. They didn't even mention Joseph, did they? Because as far as they knew, Jesus was illegitimate. Mary was with child, and Joseph was like, I didn't do it. Right? They didn't even mention him. They were only looking at the natural Jesus and not the spiritual Christ. And because that's all they were looking at, they weren't at all interested in drawing from the gift of God that was in his life. In fact, it wasn't so much that Jesus had the gift of God in his life. Jesus was the gift of God. (laughs) Jesus is God, (laughs) right? Here he is in the flesh, and they didn't see it. All they could see was the little runt that used to run around their ankles when he was a kid. The one who grew up and became a carpenter and maybe, you know, put a new window on their house. You know? What's he have to offer me? A lot of people think Jesus couldn't do many miracles there because of an atmosphere of unbelief. I don't buy it. Uh, I think if if you want to talk to me about it afterward, I'll show you other verses where Jesus walked into an atmosphere of unbelief. The epileptic boy, the the, the disciples didn't have faith, and Jesus said, he said, you couldn't cast out the demon because you didn't have faith. There you go. Uh, The the father didn't have faith. He's like, "Uh, I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. And if you can do anything, and Jesus is like, if you can do anything, if I can do anything, Anything's possible for, possible for him who believes. In other words, I believe. <laughs> Be healed. And, and the demon leaves the boy, and he's healed. Uh, then you got the funeral procession. Jesus walks right in the middle of a pr- funeral procession and raises the guy to life. I, I mean, he didn't even have faith for himself. He's dead. So I don't think Jesus was the least bit swayed by an atmosphere of unbelief. Instead, I look at this group of people who are saying, who's this natural guy? I'm going home. He's got nothing for me. And it says that he wasn't able to do many miracles there except heal a few sick people, which number one tells me he was still working miracles. And number two, it's, this is my personal opinion. It's kind of funny. It, it says, if you look in the Greek, the word for sick, it means weak and infirmed. So I like to say that the only people Jesus was able to heal that way were the ones too weak to get away. That's just a personal opinion. You can, you can do with that what you want. But... Uh, Jesus could have done so much more there if the people would have seen what was in him from God. And I'm convinced that Jesus can do so much more in your church than what you've seen so far if you will begin to see what Jesus can do through others instead of trying to figure out where do I fit, I don't know if I have the right ministry, I'm so worn out, I'm so, and, and we, we go through this very introspective Where do I fit and how do I feel? Instead of what can I do to build up somebody else? And I'll tell you what, if if we were building each other up in that sort of way, you wouldn't feel that way because you'd have all kinds of people giving you positive input, input, telling you, hey, you're doing an awesome job. I love how you minister that way. By the way, worship team, awesome job tonight. Thank you. Thank you for representing Jesus that way, representing heaven. I mean, in heaven, it's, it's worship all the time. So when we have worship here, it's like this taste of heaven. It just sets the tone. I love it. I love it. Ah. I'm going to skip down on my notes here just so we can wrap up. Uh, go to that point six there. If you, at the bottom of the page, if you want to see the power of God at work in a more consistent basis, then honor the Holy Spirit in those around you. Honor the least likely people with love and respect. Encourage those who still see themselves with natural eyes. Set their minds on things above, encouraging them on a spiritual level. And then seek to receive ministry from those people. Ask them to pray for you. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a a meeting, we're praying for healing. In in fact, I was in Livonia, Michigan uh, just a few months ago. And I was praying for a woman who had, if I remember, it was her right ankle. Uh, it was either arthritis, some, some really bad pain that was causing her all kinds of grief. But I'm down there praying for her, and nothing's happening. And I see this little five, six-year-old girl. I said, hey, you want to pray for her? And this little girl comes over there, okay. You know, I said, just put your hand on her ankle. And she does. I said, all right, just say this. Say, be healed in Jesus' name. She goes, be healed in Jesus' name. Very sweet. I said, test that out. 
She goes, yes, <laughs> totally healed. Look for Jesus in others. Draw it out of them. <laughs> All right. We tend to only honor those who we consider to be better than us in some area of life. And we tend to think of ourselves so highly that those people become harder and harder to find. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? By doing this, we deny the Holy Spirit the right to use whomever he likes, and we deny those lower than us the privilege of being used by him, at least as far as it affects our lives, because God will use them in other people's lives. You're cutting yourself short. It's time for us all to agree that we're not a group of earthly, natural people who get together week after week to sing and hear a sermon. Rather, remember that you are right now sitting in the midst of spiritual champions, most of whom were not in the list I read when we started this meeting. Right now, unless you're on an end, you're sitting next to two of them. Okay? You're sitting next to a couple of weapons that have been designed to destroy the devil's work and you are holding the ammunition. It's called encouragement. So what are you going to do with it? You're going to encourage people in worldly matters or in spiritual matters? Hmm. One thing I like to encourage people on, let's make this real practical and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, if we're going to have a culture of honor and encouragement, we have to understand how to receive encouragement well. Uh, there's an author and teacher, Bill Johnson. Many of you have probably heard of him. Um, he's, uh, he's like a, a spiritual grandfather to me, and he, he, I've only talked to him once. You know, it's, it's one of those things, like, I've, I've never had a relationship with him per se, but he's, he's breathed a lot into my life just listening to his sermons and teachings and reading his books. And uh, um, one of the things he said is, you know, if, if you've got, you know, someone does a really great solo during the offering or something, and then you go up to them after church and you say, oh, that was so beautiful, your song was beautiful. And they say, oh, it wasn't me, it was Jesus. What Bill Johnson says is, you know, in that moment, I really want to say to them, it, it wasn't that good. <laughs> but he, he holds himself back, you know. Um, <laughs> so you, we, we have this tendency to think that that is humility instead of recognizing, wait, they're, they're just honoring the gift of God in me. And he said, here's how you defer honor, not shooting it down before it gets to you, but instead saying, Thank you. That's so thoughtful. And then, in your secret place of prayer, you go to God and you say, here, I ha think I have something that belongs to you. Yeah. Ah. It's good stuff. So before you leave this building today, I, here's my challenge to you. I want you to do three things. First of all, before I even get to that, is there anybody tonight uh, with every eye open and every head up, <laughs> I tricked some of you, um, is there someone tonight who you're saying, I don't know Jesus, and you know what, I want to just say in front of my family here, I really want to follow him now, I'm seeing a different side of Jesus than I ever saw before, and I want to just give my life to him. If that's you, put a hand up. I know this is like a, a kingdom builder's night, and so we're probably all Christians here, but I never want to neglect an opportunity. Anybody? All right. All right. If you just didn't want to raise your hand, but you want to make that decision, I want you to find somebody and tell them. All right? It's good. It's good. Here's my challenge to you in closing. I want you to find three people to encourage tonight. And they, I, I, if, if I could be so bold, I'd like to give each one a specification. All right? So write these down if you have to, because I want you to remember. The first one I want to be someone in ministry, whether you know it's your pastor or a nursery worker or it doesn't matter, children's youth, uh, someone who does mu music, someone just the list goes on. Someone in ministry, all right? Sound booth often overlooked. You guys, thank you tonight. Thank you. Um, so find somebody who's who's uh, in ministry. Encourage them. Point out something of Jesus' trait in them, okay? Don't just go up and say, hey, nice blouse, because all that's going to produce is a nice blouse next week. Okay? <laughs> nice blouse is a nice start, but 
we're missing, you know, we, we're better than that. We, we can go beyond that. Look at something you see in their life, that something they're doing that is representative of Jesus. Even if you don't know them that well, you can say, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Sound guy, what's your name? Ian, thank you. I, I, this is the first church I've been in where my mic was left on through the whole service and I didn't have to work the mute button uh, because this guy is on top of things. And so thank you for staying so vigilant, so, so focused on what you're doing because obviously God is vigilant and focused on us. So do you see how that's a nature of Jesus in him that's producing me just being able to be up here and not have to worry about pushing the little mute button on my microphone? Something that simple, and yet it's Jesus being revealed. If you can notice little things like that, I'm telling you the big things will come. The big things will come. The second person, I want it to be someone who you simply want to honor on a relational level. Perhaps it's a family member, a close friend, someone you sit near in church because we always sit in the same seat week after week, right? Um, <laughs> just someone who you, you, just, you know them somehow and you want to honor them for something they've meant to you in your life. And the third one, and this one I know will be a stretch for some of us, but I really want to challenge you, especially since I know Mount Hope, you've got a, a really prophetic culture, you believe in hearing God's voice for people. I want to encourage you to just go to a total stranger, someone that maybe they're not a total stranger, maybe it's someone that you know, you just kind of, you've noticed them for years, but because it's a big church, you never really got around to having a conversation with them. But go to someone who you don't really know and just ask God, Lord, would you just give me something I can speak into this person's life? And then try it. Try it. 1 Corinthians 14, I forget which verse, but it says, uh, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. And what does that word try mean? But to just attempt, to give it a shot, Right? It's much better to try to encourage someone and then say, what are you talking about? Than for you to keep quiet and them to go around feeling like God doesn't notice me. Let's draw it out of them. Let's close in prayer. Father, you are so good. Thank you. I want to thank you, God, for this opportunity to just share life with, with friends and family here. I want to thank you for your love toward each person in this room. Thank you for the healings that you poured out in this place tonight. And if there's anybody in this place that you feel like whatever your problem was has started to come back, I command that spirit of infirmity right now, leave in Jesus' name. Never return. Never return. Be healed. In Jesus' name. Father, you're so good. Lord, I pray that you would sear this message into our hearts, that it wouldn't just be a night of a good word, but Lord, we would make a shift in the way we do life, that every one of us would start looking for new ways to encourage Christ in others, drawing out Jesus in the people around us so that you can be more clearly seen. Jesus, thank you for paying the price for every one of us, for our salvation, for our healing, for our wholeness, for our well-being. You are good. You are so good. Lord, I want to speak a blessing over every person in this place, every small group. I speak a blessing of multiplication over you in Jesus' name. Every business, favor every family favor blessing from the Lord the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace in Jesus name Amen